There's a younger generation of Pakistanis, students, who are seriously science focused. They don't want to become scientists, they don't know what science is, and they're not interested. Now this is bad for the future of the country, because everything in our modern times depends upon people being educated in science. And if you look at India, it's a totally different story. There, the overwhelming majority of Indian students want to become scientists. And many of them go on to become the, some of the world's top researchers. And this is why, this is why India is where it is. That is to say, aiming towards becoming a superpower, a major economic player in the world. Whereas on the other side of the border, we are being questioned as to whether we are a failing state or a failing state. I will not claim that this science phobia that we see is entirely due to textbooks because as I just said, there's a lot more to education than just textbooks. It's part of a national culture. And certainly we do not have a national culture that values science. We do not have science programs on television. We have a lot of political entertainment to be sure. But not very much on science at all. We cannot differentiate, for the most part, between the path-breaking work done by Abdul Salam and the copycat reverse engineering done by the bomb makers. Science is not considered attractive either by its students or their parents. So one should not be surprised, therefore, that most textbooks written in Pakistan by Pakistani authors are just not worth reading and that they have seriously impacted upon students' understanding of the subject. I've been looking at a number of them and let me tell you what I found on descriptions of surface tension. Some of you know what it is, doesn't matter if you don't. The books written in Pakistan say that this is a skin which is formed by the attraction of molecules to each other in a liquid. Now, look, I've never seen a molecule in my life. I doubt that you could have. And why should molecules attract each other and why should they be in liquids only? I'm confused as hell about this. On the other hand, if you look at a decent science book written anywhere outside, a decent one, it'll tell you, it'll tell the student, take a razor blade, place it slowly on the surface of water and note that it floats. Then it'll say, add a little bit of soap to it and the razor blade will sink. The student does that and actually arrives at an understanding of what science is. So clearly, some science books are better than others, and then the question comes about, why don't we simply take the good books that are written outside and use them in our schools, perhaps with adaptation, perhaps with translation, that should certainly make a big difference. Of course, it won't end all problems, but it should certainly make a very big difference. Now, at that point, nationalist bravado kicks in. They say that we Pakistanis are equally capable of writing very good books. Why should we rely on the Gora? Why should we rely on the Chinese? Why should we rely on anyone else? We have the best people here. But sorry, this is just empty chest eating. It's a case of large egos and low accomplishments. You see, this argument is not made when it comes to using medicines, drugs made outside. This argument is not made when flying in airplanes 
or riding in cars that were made by Boras, <coughs> it only kicks in when it comes to educating our children. So, here is something that is telling us not just about science education, it's telling us something much deeper, something much wider, something that Faisal Bari just talked about. The clash between modern education and traditional education. This failure of science education is actually systemic. It runs through the system. It's at the base of this is a rapidly growing reaction against modernity and modern education. Now let's not confuse modernity with consumption. You don't become modern by drinking Coca-Cola. And you don't become modern by riding in a you know, big car or traveling in a jet plane. You become modern when there is a mindset that looks at the world in a different way, in which reason and rationality are part of how you look at things. And so modern education is very different from traditional education. Traditional education came from up there. You could not challenge it. You had to memorize it. You could not ask your teacher, why is this? If you did, you could properly be slapped on the head. That this is the way it is. And so it was a corpus of facts, fixed, permanent, to be transmitted between generations to the next generation. Whereas modern education changes all the time. We create concepts of science. What we teach to our children today will be less relevant ten years later, even less relevant another ten years, just as it has been in the past. So, modern education evolves, traditional education is fixed. This means that our attempt to create that synthesis is bound to fail. It failed at the time of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, when he was in debate with the ulema at the Uganda, as was reminding us, there was a clash, a serious clash. That clash is irresolvable. Try and fix it as much as you can. You can't do it. You have to choose between fixed, unchanging beliefs that things are the way they are and will remain the way they will, between a way of life which says we don't know what the end is, we only know that we can use reason and logic and observation and experiment and go whichever way that takes us. Well, that's all well and good, but how do you go about it? I don't have the answer, but I do know that it has to begin at the school level and it cannot be done at the university level. Because trying and trying for the last 35 years, I know there are very definite limits to what we can do on that. Our task is getting a bit harder with time. It's because now we are seeing a guilt conscience assert itself. We are beginning to hear more and more often that this modern Western education is an imposition on us. It's there to make us brown sahas. Forget it. If we don't have this education, we are going back to the dark ages. Don't be apologetic about it. What we have to do is to take that modern education, use our reason and our faculties of discernment, and get out of it what we need for our day and age, for our society. Among those things, as I said, we need good textbooks. That's just one part of it, but it is a very important part of that. And let me end by saying that instead of asking for everything in the world today, at least as, as regards our education, 
What we need to do is define a set of very definite goals. These are not enough by themselves, but these are absolutely crucial if we are ever to become a modern nation. First and foremost, education has to begin with the premise that we need the spirit of openness. If the minds are closed, if you don't want to open minds, well, forget it. Then go to a madrasa and you get the kind of society that a madrasa produces. Go back to the Nizamul Mulk of the 11th century and if you want to know why Muslim societies across the world are stuck in a rut and have not produced one shred of science, one shred of knowledge for the last 800 years, go look at the madrasas. They will tell you. It's not lack of resources. There's plenty of oil. There's plenty of everything. It's that mindset produced by traditional education that lies at the very heart of Muslim backwardness today. So we need that openness. We have to stop viewing peoples of other countries as our friends, as people who we can live with rather than as permanent enemies. We have to stop telling lies about history. What Tariq Rahman was telling us about Bangladesh, East Pakistan, is absolutely true. We lie and lie and we create that paranoia, that xenophobia, which then drives us so that today there are 300 people here, I don't know how many, and there are 300,000 at the Taibiyaz and Mazar for the Defy Pakistan. Thank you very much.